Next, we have the uh, Royal Terrell Museum's Don Henderson, and he's going to be talking to us about estimating the volumes and masses of big plaster jackets. So I just want to mention that, um, looking out at the audience here, it's pretty amazing to think that most of you trudged into my lab space, and, but it's small doses. So um, I want to talk about um, a problem, well, it's not really a problem, a challenge we have in doing the sort of work we do at the Terrell Museum. Um, we, the whole province is our territory, and we have to transport sometimes very large jackets over huge distances, and cost starts to become an issue, and as well as safety. I worry about people's limbs. And um, so I'm just going to show two, two test cases, or two demos, of where lifting and mass considerations become really important. And then I'll go into um, about uh, some ways to, to get an idea of that. Um, as I mentioned yesterday on the tour, um, I'm a bit of a math and physics geek. So there is some, I'll warn you, there's some math in this talk. So um, there's no calculus, but um, you, you do need to pay attention to the formulae. So, I want to highlight two examples where knowing the masses of large jackets was key. Uh, one was doing this um, elasmosaurid plesiosaur, and another what, uh, was a helicopter job, dinosaur park. And then from that, I'll go on to some, some methods that I've used to try and estimate jackets. So we now have a plan. Every time a big jacket comes into the museum, we're going to weigh it right away and record its geometry before it gets prepared. And I'm hoping to build up a pattern of what, given a certain shape of jacket, what's the best formula to apply to calculate the mass of that jacket. So here's a map of southern Alberta. We are here in Drumheller. And I mentioned this job south of Lethbridge. It's in the Corite mine where they're mining for um, gem quality ammonite shell. And that distance, as the crow flies, a very energetic crow, would be 200 kilometers. But when you actually have to drive it, it's like 300 kilometers. So that's a thing to consider. Um, this is the jacket. We had the heavy equipment scrape away as much of the black, dense shale as we could, and we got it down to three blocks. We did have to do a str some strategic cuts um, right here to make it manageable, um, to, just to get it out of the ground. Um, so this, here's the audience participation bit. Um, that smaller jacket weighs just over one metric ton. Any guesses on the other two? How about the middle one? People do tend to underestimate how heavy things are. Well, no, there it is. You're a bit off. As you'll find out, overestimating can be another problem because you might, if it's too big, you end up paying for, for stuff you didn't need. And there's the other one, uh, 1.6 metric tons. So fortunately, we had the big track hoe to do this for us. And for that first block, we initially put a pallet underneath and ran the lifting straps through the pallet. But as soon as the, the straps were clear of the ground, the pallet just got munched, wrapped around it. So that's the first lifting stage. We're at the bottom of the pit here, and we have to get up to prairie level. So the first tra lift at first traveling was to go from the pit up to the first landing. We got that up to that first landing. And then they, the, the company that also does the excavations, they have a couple little machines they let us use. And so we've got that block lifted onto that first deck. So again, you have to think what machines you have available for lifting at each stage. And then he drove that up out of the, we're actually in the river valley. The mine is, the pit was right beside um, the river. So he has to drive up out of the valley, up onto prairie level. Third lift was to get it onto the deck of the, of the big trailer. Then he drove off. Um, for him, this is nothing. He probably didn't even know he had a load use the things he has normally. Next morning, that's at the back of the museum. Oh, I want to point out, the landscape here is not always gray and brown. It does get green. <laughs> and um, so now, if you're delivering, sending a big block to the museum, you have to think, well, can we deal with it on our end? Fortunately, with these ones, we could. Um, that's Tom Courtney on the, on the truck forklift there. And Jim McCabe and I holding the straps for that lift. We actually had to put extra long um, extensions on, on, the, on the forks to reach all the way in over the deck. So here's, the, here's the, the fourth moving stage, getting it into the museum. And then finally, they were sat together on the concrete floor. So now you've got a relatively concentrated load sitting on your floor. How long will that floor hold that load? Um, that's a thing you have to consider when you're uh, bringing big blocks in. So again, you want to know what sort of mass you're dealing with. 
And just in case you're wondering what was in those blocks, here's, here's the treasure that's in this. I'm always amazed that this fantastic thing was hidden in these gray black lumps. Let's go back to our map here. There's us in Drumheller. Um, we do quite a bit of work in Dinosaur Provincial Park, and every once in a while, we have some big things. Um, that's 180 kilometers straight distance from Calgary. Um, there, sometimes there are um, smaller helicopters available in Medicine Hat, but the problem is you, you want to know, how can we get a machine big enough to lift what we want to lift? Um, so most of the time, the machines have to come from, from Calgary. And my big worry is you're paying you know, $1,000 an hour at least plus fuel. He has to come there. He does his 15 minutes of work and any, any, another hour's travel time. Um, you don't want to be paying for nothing. You want to make sure you know what size machine to lift. I mean, what machine to need to do the lift. The other problem is what if you overestimate and you end up paying big dollars for a block that didn't really need that big expensive machine, so that would be a waste of money again. So this, this, this one really worries me, especially because we do a lot of really remote jobs um, and you do not want to screw up. So let's look at some examples. This is a block that our other dinosaur curator, Francois, took out with his crew last year. It's just over two tons. Um, I thought this was a reasonably regular shape to do a few test cases. So this is a top view of it. Um, I'm going to, the first one I want to show is what I call the box volume approximation. You think, what's the smallest box that you could fit, smallest rectangular box you could fit this in? So that diameter is 152 centimeters. The width is 234. And if we look at a side view and approximate that rough shape with another rectangle, it's a depth of 51 centimeters. So we've got length, width, and depth. You want to multiply them together to give you a volume. You plug in the numbers, and you get a volume of 1.8 million cubic centimeters. So you think a sugar cube is roughly about one centimeter on a side. Would you have guessed there was 1.8 million sugar cubes? I would, I would never have said 1.8 million. And we can also assume a typical rock density for rocks at the crust of the Earth is about 2.67 grams per cubic centimeter. That, but that's a rough average, including things like granites and, and basalts, not good for fossils. So the mass you get, you multiply a volume by the density rho. Uh, you plug in the numbers, and you get a mass estimate of 4.8 tons. That's not so good. So you're, the ratio is 240%. You're over by 140%. I think we can do better. So let's go back to our block view in the top. Let's try an ellipse to approximate the surface. So you could think of this as like knocking the corners off the block in top view. But we're going to treat it as a cylinder going down. And the side view, we'll, we'll, we'll get a depth of our cylinder. So what the, the strategy here is you want to multiply the elliptic area of that, of that uh, you know, top of the jacket by its depth. So the, volume for the, the formula for the area of an ellipse is a generalized form for a circle. It's pi AB. And A and B are the two radii, semi-major, semi-minor. Um, but we've measured length and width, so you have to divide them by two to get a distance from the center. So the volume for an elliptic cylinder is, is that expression. That's the area term in there. And you can see it's a D to multiply by depth. And the depth was 51 centimeters. So let's plug the numbers in. And we're down to a volume now of 1.4 uh, million, uh, million sugar cubes. And that mass is 3.8 tons. So we're a less awful estimate, 188% over, or 88% over. Let's try another approximation. Let's extend this idea of the ellipse into the third dimension. So we've got the top view. And if we look at the side, you think, what sort of ellipse is the best fit for that shape? And I found it was best using the digital photographs. You play with in a drawing program, or even a PowerPoint here, you could play with the ellipse and see, eyeball it, what looks like the best shape to use. And so the volume for an ellipsoid is a bit more complex. Um, you've got three radii to worry about now. And again, you have to divide these length, widths, and depths by two to get the distance from the center of the block. And that's the formula you get. Plug in the numbers. Now we're down to 950,000 sugar cubes. And that estimate's just 2.5 tons. 
which is not bad. I think under 25% ratio, I think that's fine. You want a bit of safety. You, you tell the helicopter people this is what it is. They'll suggest the machine that's the most appropriate. And they'll always slightly overestimate as well. Engineers always like to have a safety factor. So that was quite a good one. I, w I would go with the, the, the triaxial ellipsoid in most cases. Now the thing to remember is getting the volume is just one stage. The other component is the density, and rock densities vary. So I've, just from the literature, I got some typical density ranges for typical rocks that host fossils. And you can see there's quite the span. And what I've done here is I've recalculated the mass estimate using the triaxial ellipsoid shape for a high density estimate and a low for the different rock types. And the difference between the max and min estimates is 570 kilograms. And that 570 kilograms is 28% of the actual mass. So there can be quite a bit of wiggle um, and variation in depending on what rock type you think your specimen's in and what density it is. So one other example, um, not such a regular block this time. So December of last year, we got a call to go and deal with a plesiosaur that had been found during road construction um, north of Fort McMurray. And fortunately, yes, it was cold, but they built us a little shed, so we were fine. Um, we had to move around outside in the snow. And actually, this block that's being transported right now um, is one I want to use as, as an example. Um, we had Tom and Howie from the museum come up uh, about when we realized we were just about done. And so we got these pieces onto the back of that truck. One thing we were had to consider was the area of the blocks flat. Was the deck of our truck big enough to, to contain the, the block? Thing? Everything just fit. Oh yeah, you can see the shed they built us. After we were done, we just knocked out a side to drive the bobcat in to get stuff. It was a shame. It was really nice two by fours and plywood, and I bet they've just junked it. What a waste. But so here's this irregular block to try as a test case. Um, this represents part of the shoulder, the pectoral region, and the flipper, the fore flipper from this animal. And you can see it's about 400. Not four. It is 466 kilograms. And if you look on edge, it's a bit lumpy. So there's the chest um, neck region. That's about 30 centimeters thick. And it tapers down to the distal end of the flipper at about 15. So let's try the box approximation on this more irregular shape. And I got a mass of 1,218 kilograms. That's a terrible estimate. But you remember the other box estimate was about 240% over, or 240% was the ratio. Here, it's not that different, 260. Well, let's try and do better. Um, because it's so different in thicknesses, you know, from 15 to 30, I didn't think trying the cylinder idea would be very good with this one. So I went immediately to um, this triaxial ellipsoid. And that got it down to 638 kilograms. That's only 37% over. Actually, when I, was doing, when I was plugging the numbers away here, I actually accidentally used a 15 centimeter thickness, and I got 466 kilograms exactly. But that was just pure chance. <laughs> so whenever you're doing this, it's safer to overestimate slightly. I think that's the, the safest way to think. So um, one more method. Um, as I said, I'm math and computer geek, and if there's some technical way to do it, I'll try it. So what I did is in a drawing program, I used the polygon tool to outline the image. And from that, I wrote a program that would calculate the area of an irregular shape. And so what my program does is it decomposes any arbitrary contoured area into triangles. It calculates the area and centroid of each triangle and then does a weighted sum to calculate the center of mass of the irregular shape. But the whole process, you get a total area of that contour. So there's 11,600 roughly square centimeters within that. And so you want, and then you need an average thickness. So I just took the straight arithmetic average of that. So you multiply that top area by your average thickness, and I got 262,000 uh, cubic centimeters. And let's multiply that by the, the, my standard density. I got 700 kilograms. So the ratio is about 150%. I, in doing this, again, the thing that it doesn't really matter, you don't want to hit it dead on. Um, you want to always slightly overestimate. 
I think this would be a safe, a safe value. And you could be really fussy and take multiple thickness measurements and calculate a more sophisticated average and get, get a closer estimate. So just to sum up, um, I'm comparing the estimate, estimation methods and how bad the error was. And I think the triaxial ellipsoid would be my favorite in most cases. And it's pretty easy to apply. Not everybody can calculate the areas of regular polygons. So my recommendation would be if your block is not that rectangular, um, go for the triaxial ellipsoid. I think it would give you uh, a, a reasonable result. And you might want to get two different people to do the measuring. And don't show them your numbers. So you get independent estimates and then maybe average them. I think that would be a good strategy. Okay, and I'll stop there. <laughs>